And I invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verse 10. That's, that will be our focus, but we'll go back in a moment and read a few verses. But uh, Ephesians chapter 1, continuing our, our study in Ephesians, continuing our study with recognizing the blessings that we have in Christ. I know uh, for some of you, have the last few weeks been rather hectic and you just want to yell, Stop! <laughs> have you thought of that? And uh, sometimes, sometimes it's not just the stresses of the holidays. Sometimes there are other stresses that come our way. You know, maybe work is stressful. Maybe other things are stressful. And, and you're just kind of at that point where you want to just, you just want to uh, scream to stop. And, and uh, I, I noticed that songwriters... There's several, several songs, I didn't count them, but I bumped into several on the internet that had the idea of, uh, you know, stop the world and let me off or something like that, you know, and, and I think they're dealing with the stresses of relationships and stresses of this and that. And, and then I, I thought of that old Twilight Zone uh, series and uh, where, the, where they had the stopwatch and I brought my, brought my watch up here and uh, you know, they, you know, you you hit the stopwatch, and and it would freeze everything in the world. And then he could go about and do his thing and take what he wanted and all that kind of stuff. And I don't, I can't remember how it how it really happened, but somehow the the watch malfunctioned then, and uh, he was left in a stopped world. And everything that he wanted was at his fingertips, except nothing to do. You know, no people to spend it on. No anyway. Now you want to be careful with what you ask for, right? Maybe that's kind of the lesson with that. And uh, by the way, you know the old joke, right? What, what does it mean when a pastor puts his watch up here? Nothing. <laughs> anyway, so, so here, uh, in, but in reality, in the reality, there's coming a time when God is going to hit the button. God is going to stop this world. There is a time coming and for the world of unbelievers, that means there will be an eternity in the lake of fire. For the believers, for those who are trusting Jesus Christ, depending on Him and Him alone, that means an eternity with God in heaven and enjoying all the blessings of heaven, etc. And so uh, when, we, when we come to our verse this morning, we're going to see that that's all part of God's grand and glorious purpose. It's all a focus. It's all a focus on the conclusion of, of time, the conclusion of God's purpose. In other words, he's going to bring us to that time. And that's what our verse is all about. And it, and it, and it ought to draw us when we really think about what God has done, when we real realize what God is going to do, in eternity future, it ought to draw us to himself. It ought to draw us to worship him. It ought to draw us to magnify him. In other words, it ought to affect our life. It ought to, it ought to promote a greater trust in him even today. Because God has all things in control. He is working his grand and glorious purpose uh, to, as far as what he desires and what, what we get to be and that we get to be with him forever and ever. And so, as you notice in our, in our notes here, we are continuing with the idea of blessings, even though maybe you won't name a certain blessing that is ours today, this sense of, of being a part of God's plan and purpose is a blessing, so I've just continued with that theme of blessing out of Ephesians chapter 1. But let's take a look at our context and just see how we fit in God's eternal purpose. Picking up in verse 5. Picking up in verse 5, it, we find, having, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Notice, there's several, ver several verses and several words in our context that indicate God's purpose, God's will, God's desire. Pick up on those because it all culminates kind of in our verse where we go to eternity. So he talks about his will. Verse 6 is just, it, it just blows me away. To the praise of the glory of his grace, it, by which he made us accepted, or he graced us in the beloved. And so we have that encouragement there. Then verse 7, 
In Him, speaking about in this beloved one who is Christ, in Him we have, we possess. You know, you've been adding up the blessings that we have. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And speaking about that grace as we get to verse 8, which grace He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will. Ah, His will, the mystery. We have that tied together in the last time we were in Ephesians. According to what? His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself that, and here's our verse, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And so our focus is going to zero in on, on, verse, on verse 10, but I want to keep the context in mind. You, you kind of sneak back to verse, verse uh, 9 and you notice he made known to us the mystery of his will. And we identified that as the dispensation in which we live in, the dispensation of the grace of God, that secret dispensation. And notice how he ties it with eternity. In other words, if we take a big picture, if we take a picture of, of God's whole plan, you know, it, it, makes a, it makes a big picture of God's whole plan and purpose that would go back from before creation. If we'd have read verse 4, it says from, you know, even before creation, he had a plan in mind. He had us in mind. And then you take that all the way to eternity future. He has us in mind and we are going to partake in eternity. But, but without, but if you look at the whole context of that, of that, uh, you know, of, of the span of time, you'd say, you'd read the Old Testament, and you'd say, yep, this is going to happen. We're going to go from, uh, we're going to go from the death of Christ to the tribulation into the kingdom. And there would be a gap in the middle when you get, like, where we live today. Because in all of the Old Testament, in all of the Old Testament, the dispensation of grace, the time in which we live today, was a secret. And, uh, I, I borrowed a puzzle from the preschool back there. And uh, if, if you look at, if you, if you don't have an explanation of verse 9 that we have the dispensation of grace to fit in the middle, it's like a puzzle with a piece or two gone. It's 2,000 years of human history that, that you can't account for in the Old Testament. We have the future laid out for us. We have the past laid out for us in the Old Testament. We understand there's going to be a kingdom. We understand there's going to be eternity. But without the mystery dispensation of grace, it's like something's missing. And that's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago as we were in, e in Ephesians 1.9. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look ahead. But when he says fullness of time here, when he talks about the idea of fullness of time, he's talking about the puzzle being complete. And you can't be complete without what he talked about in verse 9, the mystery dispensation of grace. We're going to touch on that in a second. And, and in fact, and in fact if, we, if we think in terms of, and notice the very, you know, almost the first word, a, the dispensation, I'm going to go to point number one and I'm going to give you a little dispensational review. The dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, some of your translations may not have it. The NIV doesn't have the word dispensation. Uh, some of your other translations may have the word administration or stewardship. Good words, and uh, they explain they explain what this is. But the word dispensation comes from comes from two basic Greek words, meaning house and law. So it's a it's house and law, the rule of a household. In Luke chapter sixteen, you have the idea of uh, a steward there or a household manager. Dealing with, uh, dealing with the rules of a household. And, and if I would stop and, and think about that idea of uh, dealing with a household, uh, you would have someone in charge of the household. If, if you were a wealthy enough person, you would have a steward. You would have someone in charge of that household. He took care of you. When we were on our, on our uh, cruise ship, when we were in, uh, in the Mediterranean, we had a steward who took care of a certain segment of rooms. And he came by to make sure everything was just right. And of course, he often was ready for a little tip, but uh, 
that's the other part of the story. But uh, but you know he took care of that. He took that care of that. That was his responsibility. And in a sense, that's all a dispensation is. It's the rule of the house, the rule of the the boat. And what Paul does then is he borrows that same word and he takes it over to the rule of the world. And and throughout history, God has given different people responsibilities uh, as far as what the what the household would be. So God is the house, God owns the house and God makes the rules. Uh, by the way, in some of your homes, in some of your homes, I imagine some of you do not have a salt shaker on the table, right? Some of you might not have a salt shaker on the table because someone has hypertension or high blood pressure or heart, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just not on the table. And maybe a few years ago it was. Maybe you had a salt shaker on the table, now you don't for your health and that kind of thing. Maybe there's other rules in your house. Maybe in your house you wouldn't have antlers on the wall like I have antlers on the wall, you know. Maybe in your house you would have, you know, maybe there's something else that you have rules of your household. What the basic idea is that, hey, God has a household. The world is his household. And over the course of time, he has established rules. And sometimes those rules have changed. Not that God has changed. God is eternal. God is always omniscient. God is always all powerful. God is always all merciful and loving, etc. God is always just. But he has changed his rules over time, and we're going to just give a we're going to give you just a brief review of those. But I want to remind you that in, that Paul's focus is grace. That's why he brought up grace. He brought up the mystery dispensation in verse nine. That's why he brought that up. And then to, and it's clearly marked several places as we as we get to Ephesians chapter three. We're going to see. The dispensation of the grace of God given to me for you. I mean, that's clearly delineated several places in the scripture. And so God gave Paul the responsibility of grace, just like he gave Moses the responsibility of law. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, when, when you think about the other dispensations, let me just kind of give you a little background where we get the names of some of those. And uh, promise is an easy one because God uses the word promise in Galatians chapter 4 when he talks about Abraham. And he compares it and contrasts it to, uh, to other dispensations. The law is easy. Paul contrasts grace and law in Romans chapter 6. What does he mean? Well, he doesn't use the word dispensation there, but he means that God had a program of grace and he had, he had a program of law and now he has a program of grace. I mean, he just... He's just sharing those things. And so even though the names aren't there, even though the, the, the name dispensation isn't given, the principle of dispensations are throughout the scripture. So that's something we can see. And so we're going to go back and we're going to look. But notice for this, for this study, I've added the idea of full time and, or the fullness of time. It was kind of crowded to say fullness. So we just put full time on our chart here to give you an idea. But let's just kind of take a, a little little trip down uh, review lane here, if you will, and, and we'll take a look at the, the dispensations one at a time. And, you know, oftentimes I get a phone call or oftentimes some, and, and I, I mentioned that we as a church are, we teach dispensationally or we're dispensational, and some will say, man, I don't know what that means. Well. Sometimes it has to do with Bible translations, you know, because like I mentioned, uh, your New American Standard will use the word administration or stewardship. Sometimes it's other things, but if you, the old King James had the idea of dispensation, you notice mine had the word dispensation, and it's basically God's house law. But what I'll often do is I'll step back and I'll say, you know, you know that there was a difference between Adam in the garden and Adam out of the garden. Oh yeah, oh yeah. All you got to do is read the first few verses of Genesis. And you know that there was a big difference. When Adam was in the garden, he was in innocence. You know, we can't imagine that because every one of us are born into sin. We can't imagine that. Even our minds, and we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 2, even our minds are depraved. We don't think right. 
from the get-go. We're born in sin. And so, uh, so after, as, as God was judging regarding the fall, he promised he was going to send a seed that would crush Satan's head. In other words, he gave them hope right from the beginning. So Adam and Eve fell, and God says, well, why don't you live according to your conscience? And they did so well that right away, the firstborn son killed, you know, Cain kills Abel. And then you go along and you have Lamech committing murders. And then you have, you have the world in such wickedness that God says, man, I wish I, I want to do over. <laughs> well, almost. But in Galatians, or in Genesis chapter 6, what does God do? He sends the flood, doesn't he? And uh, then, he, after, after Noah gets out of the flood uh, and uh, lands the ark, etc., he said, I got, a, I got an idea. I want you to govern each other. In other words, establish human government. It's kind of interesting. Murder is, murder, he tells us in Genesis chapter 9, is a slap in the face to the Creator. Murder is a slap in the face to the Creator. But what did Cain do? What did Lamech do? What was, the world was in wickedness. And, and he gets to human government. He said, all right, then I want you, as the government then, I want you to judge things like murder. And capital punishment was established in human government. God doesn't ever really get rid of human government. He doesn't eliminate it from the, from the scene or we'd have chaos today. But uh, the idea of human government, it works so well. God says, I want you to repopulate the whole earth. And what did they do? Oh, they banded together. And they built a, they built a tower, a tower to God, a tower that contained God. It was really idolatry. It was really idolatry, self-centeredness. And uh, so they failed there, and God said, all right, I'm going to confound the languages, and, he, and with, uh, if we couldn't talk to each other, if you, and I, if you couldn't understand me right now, you'd get up and leave, or you'd want to. Well, I'm not trying to give you an excuse, but uh, no. When, uh, one, year, uh, one year back when I was working construction in Alaska, we went to, we, we went to church. And uh, we're sitting in the church service, and, uh, and man, they sang some good old hymns, and they just belted them out, and they were so refreshing to hear. You know, just, it was just refreshing to hear these people just singing, and there was a little accent to their voice and that kind of thing, but it was just, it was just wonderful to sit there. And then, and then the guy got up to do the message, and he, he apologized to us there. He said, well, we're going to do the rest in Yupik. And so in other words... We sat there and we just heard Babel. And we wanted to leave. We were there for six more Sundays. We never went back. I think you get the point. Here they are building a tower. And you say, hey, go get the nails. What'd you say? <laughs> you know? Or, or here, adjust that. Cut this six inches off. What? You know, next thing you know, they're fighting and leaving. And the, God accomplished his purpose of spreading them out. But... They have languages. And then, what God decided, okay, I'm not going to deal with a whole bunch of you guys. I'm going to deal with one family. And with the one family, he, he called on Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he says, I'm going to make a promise to you that through you, through your family, your family nation, all the world is going to be blessed. In other words, he's going to bring Christ. What it eventually amounts to is that Christ would come through that family. Well, that family is responsible for, really responsible for sending Christ to the cross. I mean, they rejected him when he came and they allowed, they, they sent him to the Romans to be executed. And so, but what's interesting is that 400 years into this promise, 400 years into this promise, a little over, God said, we're going to make a, we're going to give law. And so he raised up Moses with this, within this family and he gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments plus, and, uh, and, and the law was, Galatians says, the law was added. So the law ran concurrently with promise, but the law ends at the cross. There's more promise yet to come. There's more promise yet to come because Christ will come back, but it goes to the cross. In other words, what's the epitome of breaking law? It's murder again. It's the killing of Jesus Christ. 
the law was broken. God has said, here's my, here's my righteous standard, and they broke the law. But then, so then what God, God does is he, he does the mystery dispensation, the mystery, the secret, something never before revealed in all of the Old Testament. Nothing connects to the Old Testament in a sense. He, bring, he raises up the Apostle Paul with the dispensation of grace. We are still in the dispensation of grace. It's gone for nearly 2,000 years. But today, salvation is purely and totally by grace where God, is, God, is, God chose His man, Paul, to bring Christ to the whole world without worrying about Israel doing their job. That's how Israel, Israel was, to, was to bring the blessing of Christ to the whole world. They failed by crucifying the Savior, and so God raised up Paul to do it apart from them. That's why they got kind of ticked off every time Paul brought up in the book of Acts, oh, I'm going to the Gentiles. What? You can't go to the Gentiles. You know, that wasn't, they, they were the ones that were supposed to do that uh, through, their, through their acceptance. Anyway, this is going to end one of these days. We're going to be out of here. One of these days, God is going to rapture us. He's going to catch us, together, catch us up in the clouds, and we will be with the Lord forever. Bam. It can happen at any moment. At any time, we will be caught up together in the clouds. That's why I usually have that symbol there with the idea of grace. We're going to be caught up, meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. And 2 Corinthians 5.1 tells us we have a home eternal in the heavens. That's why our thinking is to be there in Colossians chapter 3. But after we're gone, God will step back in with the idea of God's promises dealing with Christ on the throne. Now we'll have seven years of tribulation, then we'll have the kingdom where Christ rules and reigns. At the end of that kingdom, so keep it clear in your mind, at the rapture, grace believers will be in heaven. During the kingdom, a thousand years, there will be a Jewish focus, and we'll, we'll step back to the Jewish focus of promise, and for a thousand years, Christ will rule and reign. But he still gives Satan uh, an opportunity to raise his ugly head right at the end of that thousand years. Uh, and, and my thinking is, man, don't do that. You know, I, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to. But at, a, at the end of a thousand years, God is going to, I mean, really, all, all God's do, dealings with man is gracious. But he, at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be doomed and cast into the lake of fire. And then there will be a judgment for all those who, all those who uh, reject him. They will all be brought before him at the great white throne. But then, then we enter what this, where our verse comes in, the fullness of time. In other words, time is full. Everything that God promised, all the dealings with man, time is full. And so the idea of this fullness of time, we're, we're going to go into a little more detail of that now if we step into, into our context and go to point number two, the fullness of time. I started it with the word dispensation because notice, notice how our verse begins. That in the dispensation, well, what's interesting, uh, what's interesting in this in this verse is that the word "the" is not in front of the word dispensation here, literally in the Greek. It's literally there's literally nothing in front of it, and we might put a dispensation. I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not convinced God is adding. Another, another dispensation and naming it fullness of times. And I'm, that might be a little differently than what I've mentioned in the past. I'm not sure that, and, and in fact, I'm not going to add it to my basic dispensational chart. Basically, what we're doing here is we're stepping into eternity, whereas all the other dispensations deal with man in human history and time. Here we're going beyond time. So I'll let you deal with that. But this is the only time that he that he kind of talks about this dispensation of fullness of times. And so I'm not sure he's totally naming it like, like he did uh, some of the other dispensations and making that comparison. In a sense, what he's saying with fullness of times is, is that time's up. That's kind of what he's saying. 
He's kind of saying, we've got to a place here that time's up. Time will be no more. The, the stopwatch has, we've pushed the button. The time has stopped. And man's time is done. And we step into this, this, uh, this eternity where there's no hours or minutes or days or months or years. We're stepping into, we're stepping into eternity. We're stepping into an infinity. We're stepping in a, into timelessness. And we can't wrap our minds around that, can we? We can't wrap our minds around really being in eternity where nothing counts. I mean, all of us have probably asked the children's question, where did God come from? Right? We've all thought that. Where did God come? When was his birthday? When did he begin? You know, we all think of those kinds of things. We, we can't wrap our minds around eternity and going on forever. We don't get it. We don't get it. That's why I've titled this message, Beyond Time. God's plan beyond time. Notice it's not the land before time, it's the plan beyond time. All right? <laughs> there was no land before time, according to the scripture. And so if we look at the idea of God's plan before time, there are other places that give us some hints. Turn with me quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, we're just going to see another, another section that kind of deals with, with the things that lead up to eternity and maybe some things in eternity. We're not going to cover the whole, the whole thing, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 23 is where we'll begin. And uh, one of the things I need to mention about 1 Corinthians 15 is that the whole section, the whole chapter is about resurrection. And this is where we end up usually every, every resurrection day. As we celebrate the resurrection, we end up in this chapter because it's so, it's so solid and so, so prominently emphasizes different aspects of the resurrection. But pick up with me in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15. But each one of you in his own order. Oh, he's talking about resurrections. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. So Christ was raised and then he's the first fruits, meaning there's going to be more that follow. And then those that are, that are Christ that is coming, we have the hope of resurrection. When you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it talks about the glorious coming of the Lord that, that is for us. What's going to happen? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We are going to partake of his resurrection uh, when, we, when, when the Lord comes back. And he could have said more here, but he doesn't. But notice what he says in verse 24. Then comes the end. Time stops. In a sense, when, he, when we get to, when, when, that's, what, that's what he's talking about is time stopping. When he delivers the kingdom to God. So he's jumped clear to the end of the kingdom. And he says he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. Well, that rule and authority and power has to do with Satan's rule and authority and power, according to the next verse. For he must reign till he puts all his enemies under his feet. And so when is that going to be? At the end of the kingdom, when he puts Satan into the lake of fire, just what we reviewed when we talked about the kingdom. He puts Satan into the lake of fire, and then he has the great white throne judgment, and everybody who doesn't believe the gospel is cast into the lake of fire. In other words, all his enemies are, are put there, and the last enemy is, that shall be destroyed is death. Remember, we're talking about resurrection, so that's what that has to do with. Verse 27, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things under, are put under him, it is evident that he, God, who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, you have God the Father, God the Son. There is an order here. Now, verse 28, now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be sub subject to him, God, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. He's getting to eternity here. He's getting to when time is no more and all things will be put under the, under the feet of Jesus and Jesus puts all things under God and he says God is going to be magnified as all in all. That gives us a hint as to what eternity is all about. Magnifying God. That gives us that, that idea. 
So compare that now to our text. Come on back to Ephesians. Come on back to Ephesians chapter 1. And notice what he goes on to say in point number 3 where he says he summed up. He summed up all things in Christ. Some of our translations vary here. Uh, I, I like the idea of being of a summation. It comes from the, the two Greek words, head up. The New King James is, makes it kind of long here. It says, uh, he might gather together in one. In other words, all those words are from, from this word, head up. The point is, is that God has a goal. In fact, the very first word, the very first word in this verse ties verses 10 and 11 together in it, and it has movement into it. In other words, he, he, ends, verse, he ends verse 9 with uh, what he purposed in, in himself, and he moves right in that in the dispensation of times, to the dispensation of fullness of times, to that, to that era when time is full, he is going to head up, he's going to summarize everything under Christ. The only other time this word is used in Rome, is in Romans 13, 9, where he says all the law is summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's the sense of a summation. That's the idea of this word. And so he, he's, he's emphasizing here, summing up all things, all things in Christ. They're all under his authority, like 1 Corinthians 15 told us. They're all under his authority. Well, what things? He says things in heaven and things in earth. Things in heaven, things in earth, they're all summed up underneath Christ. Well, stop and think with me a minute. We can just make this a general statement that says, yeah, everything's all under Christ. That's kind of the way the translators did it. Everything's all in one big ball under Christ. But I'm not sure that's, that's the way we ought to think. So I'm going to challenge you. He doesn't give us a lot of detail here. Remember, we are taken up into heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, we have a home eternal in the heavens. We're dwelling in heaven for eternity. The kingdom folks, the Jewish people receive the promises. They're dwelling on earth for a thousand years. And then comes the end. What's God <coughs> going to do? He's going to renovate the earth, the heaven and earth with fire. In other words, he's going he's to make a new heaven and a new earth. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. Why bother making a new heaven? Why bother making a new earth? If they're not to be dwelt in. And so my thinking is, and this is interpretation, okay? My thinking is, is that we who have dwelt in heaven in the glories and wonders of heaven for a thousand years, and then the end comes... I think we're going to inhabit the new heaven as well. And I think when we, those that are on earth, they're going to have that promise. Because there's several places in, in the Old Testament where God promises an eternal kingdom under, under David's seed. An eternal kingdom. So I think there's still somewhat of a separation between the body of Christ and Israel. Even in, into eternity. That's, that's my opinion based on those scriptures that I, that I just kind of tossed out. But the bottom line is that everything is under God's rule and design. Everything fits his plan. Everything fits his purpose. And, and let me share this quote with you. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, There's nothing higher than God's final purpose. Nothing beyond his final purpose. It's bigger and greater than our personal salvation. What? To us, there's nothing greater than our personal salvation, right? But, he's, but that's his statement here. This is bigger and greater than even our personal salvation. In this verse, we're transported, and he's referring to our verse, we're transported above our personal salvation into the realm of ultimate things. God's grand, comprehensive, final, ultimate purpose. And he says the human mind can never contemplate anything greater. Hmm. It made me stop and think about God's ultimate purpose. And, and if, if that's even partially true, 
and from what we've looked at in this verse, that God has an ultimate purpose and plan, where should our focus be today? In light of this verse, that God has a grand scheme and plan, that everything's going to be summed up underneath Christ, and that if we tie in that Corinthians verse, that God is going to be all in all. Wouldn't our, shouldn't our attitude today be to magnify Him? Shouldn't it be to, to worship Him? Let me just share a couple of verses with you. One of those being right in our context. Verse 6 again. The praise of the glory of His grace. Part of God's design is that ultimately His grace is praised and magnified and glorified. There's an, ex, there's an exaltation of, of God the Father through that. And as we read other verses like Roman, Revelation 23, 22, 13, it says, He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. That means He has all things in hand. He began it all. He will conclude it all. Because He is all in all. He alone is worthy. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God had a plan from the beginning of creation, all for Himself. All to magnify and glorify and exalt Himself. Revelation 7 goes on and says, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 19.6 6 says, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? From the Hallelujah Chorus. He reigns. He's omnipotent. He's the Lord God. As we ponder the fullness of times, I hope we can identify with John's words as he closes the book of Revelation. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Stop the clock. Mm -hmm.